Hi slash x slash. So here's this. Something happened to me on the morning of September 24, 2003. Through the years I had discarded the whole thing as a dream or a hallucination, until I came across a picture on Instagram that perfectly described the place I visited on that fateful day 18 years ago. First of all, you will have to excuse my terrible English. I was born in South Africa in 1981 but moved to Argentina when I was three, which is where I grew up. Everything was always as normal as it gets there is really nothing special about me or my life. On September 24, 2003, however, I was involved in a pretty heavy traffic accident. I was driving a motorbike when a woman came out of nowhere trying to cross the street. The car next to me swerved to avoid her and ended up hitting me and another car. When I woke up, I was there. I was in what you now call the back rooms. When I came across the pic related, I knew immediately that was the same place where I had been, or had dreamed I had been, all those years ago. I tried to devour every thread and YouTube video I could find on the topic, but at some point it just became way too much, way too complex and way too different from what I experienced. For me, it was much simpler. I woke up alone in a room. Old carpet yellowish walls, bright buzzing lights. Not exactly the same as the picture but eerily close to it. The room was totally square, about 2.5 m tall, and with no furniture or other objects of any kind. I woke up lying on the carpet in the middle of the room. I was wearing the same clothes I had at the time of the accident, but my watch was gone. Parts of the carpet around me appeared to be stained with big black dots. I felt something on my forehead and realized there was blood in my hands, arms, head, and pants, but I wasn't injured or cut or even in pain. I did feel slightly dizzy and confused. When I got up to my feet and looked around I thought to myself that I must be at the hospital. The room had an exit, with no door that lead to what appeared to be a hallway so that's where I walked, and that's where the nightmare began. The panic came very soon, although it's certainly amazing how long you can keep telling yourself that there must be some explanation. I must have walked for over an hour through hundreds of empty rooms and long hallways, all with the same carpet, yellowish walls, and buzzing lights. Everything was empty and there was nothing that could serve as some sort of landmark but somehow I knew that every room was different. For eight hours I roamed through the back rooms. Then, on the ninth hour, I found a shoe. It's hard to describe the extreme joy that I felt after finding something so mundane. It was just a shoe, just one, in the corner of a room. It was little girl's shoe. It looked like the shoes girls would wear to church in the late 1980s, that's the best reference I can give you. Just a shoe. But it was at least something. It gave the back room some sense of scale and it gave me some sense of hope. I picked it up and put it in my jacket. I walked for another eight hours and found more objects throughout the many rooms, a broken pair of glasses, an empty tissue box, a chessboard with no pieces, a beautiful volume of Aquino's Summa Theologica, printed in London in 1902, and some aluminum foil. I even found a room with a dirty couch in it. It somehow seemed I was getting closer to civilization, whatever that meant. What I hadn't been able to find, however, was food or water. With very little energy left, I resigned myself to camp for the night, the bright buzzing lights didn't allow such distinctions take some rest and hope for the best the next day. The voice woke me up. I knew right away it was a human voice, though I couldn't quite make out what it was saying. I jumped up to my feet and started to pay attention to where the voice was coming from so I could follow it. As I was getting closer I could hear what it was saying. 700, I looked in room after room turning from hallway to hallway, and the voice became much clearer. 
Zäfen holt er den Egen an der Tisch. Zäfen holt er der Feuer Tisch. I finally got to a large, rectangular room which actually looked populated. There were two couches, an old wooden table, and some trash. It was the least empty room I had found until that point. And there, in the corner, was a man in a squatting position, looking at the wall and waving his hand as he counted numbers in Dutch. The man was probably in mid-thirties. He was bold, had a thick beard and dark skin. He heard me come into the room, interrupted his counting and turned his head to look at me. He looked surprised to see me standing there, but not really shocked. After staring at me for a few seconds he turned his head back to the wall and resumed his counting. As tired and dehydrated as I was, I was ecstatic to find another human being so I approached him and greeted him in Afrikaans, which I can barely speak anymore. He stopped counting, got up to his feet and looked at me with more interest now, and asked my how I knew the language of his father. I told him I was born in a place where many people spoke a similar language, and he looked at me with a funny smile and told me that was impossible. He then handed me an old plastic bottle, so old that the plastic had turned yellow, with some water in it, and I drank until the bottle was empty. Without saying a word, he handed me a chocolate energy bar, and pointed towards one of the couches, where there were bags of chips and some other junk food. We both ate in silence for a while until he asked me who I was and what I was doing there. I told him my name and said that I was lost. I asked him his name and what the place was. My father called me son, so that's what you can call me. This place is the world. I told him that the world surely extended beyond the yellowish walls but once again he looked at me like he didn't understand. There is no beyond. This is the world and those who look for an exit are foolish. My father told me this. I learned that son had been in the back room since he was a little kid. Both his father and him were transported decades before from what I suspect was somewhere in Indonesia. He had no memory of the front rooms, the back rooms was all he knew. I asked him about this exit that his father used to talk about. He told me many people think that the world is a labyrinth and that many spend their lives looking for a way out. His father, who had probably looked for an exit for years, had finally resigned himself to live the rest of his life in the back rooms. I told son that I was a foolish because I also thought there must be a way out. I told him I was determined to find it and all I needed was to know where to procure food and water. To my surprise, he decided to come with me. Only a few rooms from Sun's room there was a passageway to a particularly large hallway where the carpet felt wet. A single faucet came out of one of the far walls, and it was dripping constantly. It could not really be opened, but if you left a water bottle underneath long enough then it would fill to the top. Incredibly, there were also two vending machines on that same wall. The glass had been broken and junk food was pouting out of both of them. That was Sun's oasis, where he could get food and water to survive. When I asked him what he would do when the food ran out, he looked at me with surprise and told me matter-of-factly that it never ran out. I asked him why he didn't live in that room with the food and water, and he said that sometimes it got too crowded and that he didn't like some of the groups that also came for supplies. After stocking up in food or water, it was time to go. I asked Sun how big the world was and how well he knew it. He told me it was not infinite but that its real size had not been revealed to any man. He said that he knew the land of Sun very well, which was term he used to describe all the rooms and hallways he had mapped out in his head. I then inquired if his father had ever come close to finding this exit or anything related to it, but he firmly rejected the idea. Sun wouldn't recommend where to go and he didn't even want to lead the way. He just wanted to follow me. For a moment I pondered between two options, trying to keep walking on a straight line, 
as much as the layout of the rooms allowed it, and hoped that we would eventually get to the edge of the world. The other option was to follow the ancient Greek's advice to escape a labyrinth, which is to always turn left. I decided on the second one, and just like that son and I were on our way to find an exit to the back rooms. For seven days we roamed. It was hard to keep track of time but I'm sure it was at least seven days with seven nights. I learned about back rooms. I learned that large rectangular rooms with water faucets and seemingly bottomless vending machines were a relatively common feature, each one no more than a day's journey from the other. I learned that even though it's mostly empty space, we were definitely not alone. One day we saw a little blonde girl crying alone in a corner, but when we approached she just ran away. One night as we were sleeping, an old German man came to us begging for water. We found two Chinese twins that couldn't or wouldn't talk to us. There was emptiness and confusion in everyone's eyes. I want to make clear right now that everything I saw in the back rooms had that same aesthetic, dull carpet, yellowish walls, bite buzzing lights. I know people talk about different levels, about low hanging mist, about some kind of creature or monster lurking around. I never saw or heard any of that. Everything was that carpet, those walls and those lights. An occasional pipe or duct would decorate a room but for the most part that's how it was. I did earn from Sun that the back rooms had not always looked like this, but he didn't know how they looked before. Sun had also told me that there were many families or groups in the world, and that not all of them were good. I never saw any of these groups until the very last day, when we found the Cult of the Stair. The Cult of the Stair was a group of about 20 people, men and women, who lived in one of the largest rooms I ever saw in the back rooms, it even had three vending machines. They had a leader which they called Justice, and even though they spoke English between themselves I could clearly see it was a very international group. Justice was originally from Spain, which you would think would have made it easier for me to communicate with him, but everyone there seemed to be a in some sort of perpetual enlightened slash brainwashed slash crazy state that made it really hard to get answers to my questions. Sun distrusted them all, and told me many times we should continue our own journey. However, that's when Justice took me to their holy place, the stair. A few hallways away from their main room, the cult of the stair had their ceremonial center, a room with a staircase. It was just an ugly concrete staircase with cheap metal railing, and it went up and down, with no visible end in sight either way. I asked where the staircase led, and they told me it led up and down. Same carpet, same walls, same lights, just apparently infinite levels of it. I learned that every seven cycles, some arbitrary unit of time that the cult defined, they would offer a sacrifice to the stairs and someone would let themselves be thrown down the shaft. They would watch the person fall until they disappeared from sight. I was so shocked by these pagan practices that I failed to notice when they made a circle around us. Someone very strong hugged me from behind and held me in place while someone else was quickly tying my hands behind my back. Sun put up a good fight, and he even managed to knock down one of the bigger guys but he also was ultimately subdued. The last few things I remember is the chanting, the screaming and the praying. I remember seeing Sun out of the corner of my eye as he was thrown down the stair shaft. And then me. Then I was flying through the air, falling down the shaft. I fell down for what it seemed like an eternity and then darkness. Complete darkness, more darkness and then some hospital sounds. I was lying on a bed at the Italian hospital in Buenos Aires. My whole family was there, doctors were there and even the family lawyer was there. They told me I was in a bad traffic accident and had a broken rib. Other than that I was okay. Time went by and I always though of the whole thing as some sort of anesthesia induced dream. Sometimes though, very once in a while. I wonder if Sun is living a good life back in Indonesia.
Great read OP. How long were you unconscious IRL? That's actually a great question and something I forgot to mention. According to my family, I was unconscious for a little over 20 minutes, maybe less. This has always been hard for me to comprehend as I'm sure I spent at least 9 days in the back rooms. <laughs>